Greetings folks and thanks for joining us. Today we look at the electrifying topic of boat power, that shocking subject that sparks the interest in most of us. How it works, how it flows, and what we can do to ensure that your most valuable resource is not wasted. So let's first take a look at a basic circuit, where electrons flow from a battery to an appliance or device. We have a 12 volt battery running a 12 volt fan, so what exactly is 12 volts? Voltage refers to the amount of force that can move the electrons through the circuit. The higher the voltage, the stronger that force. From this, we can understand that a 24 volt system has greater force to move electrons. Now, you probably don't have much of a choice unless you are installing your own new system. The current or flow of electrons that the appliance needs to function is measured and rated in amps. Some appliances such as fans, LED lights and other small devices require less amps than some of the power hungry items such as autopilots, fridges and up to the main culprits such as a windlass. To power these appliances we must have a complete circuit made up of wiring and not all wires are created equal. The best conductors are made from expensive metals so if you can afford it fit your boat out with silver. The next best options are copper and then tinned copper. To ensure good flow, connectors must be correctly secured and covered with heat shrink to keep out moisture and avoid unwanted contacts. So our 12 volt force is pushing a certain amount of amps to run an appliance. There is one other factor we have to take into account, resistance. The thinner the wire, the more resistance we can expect. Resistance is measured in feet, so the longer the wire we use, the higher the resistance. If we want to check resistance, just google the AWG gauge chart to check wire types and resistance ratings. The chart on the ABYC website also offers information to assist in choosing the right wire gauge. The links are below. If we use wire that is too thin or too long for a certain appliance, the first thing we can expect is a voltage drop and the item's performance will be affected. Our most worrying concern is that increased resistance creates heat and heat can create fire, something else we want to avoid at all costs. Let's have a look at that chart again and go through an example. Look at the first bit of info at the top of the chart, ABYC, both US and the Coast Guard permits a maximum 3% voltage drop in a 12 volt system. This pertains to critical systems such as power distribution points, navigation lights and critical electronics. For other minor systems and devices, they allow a 10% voltage drop. When we purchase an appliance, we get the amperage rating from the information booklet or online. Some will list only the power, which is rated in watts. To calculate amps, we just divide the watts by the voltage. So our fan is rated at 30 watts, divided by 12 volts, which tells us that our fan draws 2.5 amps. Please, folks, this is just an example. Don't fill the comment section with where to buy fans. Now we know the amps required will fall in the 5 amps or lower box on the left column of the chart. Next we have to work out how long the wiring will be. It states here clearly that this should be measured from the source to the device and then back to the source. Let's say we are installing a fan in the V-berth and calculate this to be a total of 60 feet. Now we run along our distance row at the top of the chart to 60 feet. The block where the two boxes meet inform us that we should be using a 10 gauge wire to install this fan. Now here's the interesting part. The higher the gauge, the thinner the wire. I don't know why it is, it just is. Probably related and rated to resistance. The thicker the wire, the less the resistance, the lower the gauge. Just as devices need power, our channel needs your support. So please go ahead, hit that like button and help us grow. Now, back to business. If you don't have the time or skillful maths, here's a handy app you could try. It costs only $5 and is super helpful. It's called Electro.Pro, so let's have a look. We are trying to find the voltage drop to expect in our installation. 
So look for the voltage drop calculator and enter the required information. I have already loaded the 10 gauge as my wire option, including the distance of wire from source to item and back again. I have even told the app that I plan to use copper as my wire option. The load of the fan is 2.5 amps. The resulting voltage drop shows at 1.4%, which is more than acceptable. Just to see my other options, I will change the wire to gauge 14, a thinner option, and see what that gives us. With a 14 gauge wire, the voltage drop now shows a 3.55% voltage drop. Let's try a 12 gauge wire. That shows us a voltage drop of 2.23%, which should have our fan performing nicely. Now, knowing what we know, we can take a look at a very basic power installation. We usually power our boat with a dual battery setup. One starter or cranking battery, and then our house battery bank, made up of one or multiple batteries to run our devices. Our selector switch allows us to decide where we want our power to come from, and gives us the ability to isolate the starter battery so we don't drain it on appliances and it stays charged for use in getting us going again. Cables to and from the selector switch will carry most of the loads required on our boat, so we should be using lower gauge wire which offers less resistance and accommodates higher loads. This will provide power to a distribution point such as a bus bar, where it can flow to other devices and areas. Bus bars are also amp rated, so make sure you purchase and install the correct ones. The bus bar allows us to power our hungry and high amp devices, such as a windlass, provide power to the engine bay, possibly run an inverter, and then provide power to the cabin area. Each of these should have its own isolating switch so we can turn power off as required. They should also be fitted with circuit breakers, but we'll come back to those a bit later. Now our distribution continues and power requirements start to taper off and wire gauges get a little bit more manageable. Here we might want to power some other high usage culprits such as the fridge and possibly autopilot. The final supply goes to our panel board, which controls all the smaller devices on board. At this stage, we are probably using the same wire gauge to power all these devices, so it might be a good idea to use different colored or patterned wire installations so it's easier to troubleshoot when things need attention. It's important to note that positive wires from the positive terminal of a battery are usually red in color with red heat shrink and marked with a plus symbol. Our next device, and as close to the source as possible, is a fuse. The fuse must be rated as close as possible to the amps required to run the device. They come in various designs, but are all designed to burn through and break the circuit if we have any power surges or short circuits. They protect the wiring further along the circuit so that the wiring does not create too much heat and increase the risk of fire. Once we have sorted out any issues with the device or connections, we can replace the fuse and once again complete the circuit. Next up, we want to install a switch. Again, there are many to choose from, but it would be nice to install an illuminated switch so that we know which devices are on or not. To be able to illuminate the switch, we have to also connect it to the negative or ground terminal. All of these should be visible and accessible so that we can conserve power and check fuses if needed. This is basically our panel board, and the amount of switches depends on the features of the particular vessel. The circuit continues onto our device, which is also connected to the negative or ground. The negative or ground distribution is similar to what we just saw in the positive wiring, but does not run through circuit breakers, fuses, or switches. If the fan stops working, we have to follow the flow and troubleshoot from the device back. First, we check the switch. If the switch has power, then the issue is either in the wiring to the fan or the fan itself. Using a multimeter, we can check if any current is flowing to the fan. If it shows as good, then the problem is with the fan. If the voltage shows as zero, then check the wiring. If we go and check the switch and it has no power, then we take a step back and check the fuse. If the fuse is gone, Try to work out why 
correct the problem and replace the fuse. If the fuse is good, go further back and check any circuit breakers and test for current using the multimeter at the different connections. So, speaking of circuit breakers, they function just as fuses do, but can be reset. If the load becomes too much for its rating, it will trip. This protects all wiring onward. Circuit breakers are installed at points of high load. Once the issue has been resolved, we can reset the breaker and complete the circuit. So where and when do we connect and power our bilge pumps? This is a Patreon pump. It's there to remind you that the channel needs your support. Please check out the Patreon, PayPal and Super Thanks options to assist us in any way you can. Much appreciated. We want our bilge pumps to work at any time, as long as we have power in our batteries. So we need to connect these pumps directly or as close as possible to the battery so that any accidental loss of power does not affect their performance. Any inline fuses must be checked and pump performance tested regularly. It's recommended to use a pump with an auto switch function or a float switch and illumination to show when pumps are running. This will bring any issues to your attention as these pumps are hard to hear when placed deep inside a bilge. All right, let's tie her off and kick back some cold ones, huh? 